Well, as you can see, I'm joined by uh, Dame Chester Joe and David Wooding. Lovely to see you both. And appropriately enough, um, I mean, there really is only one place to start, and that is with the Labour leadership contest. Jeremy Corbyn is in place. We're beginning to see the outlines of a shadow cabinet, uh, but already we're being told uh, that if you don't support Jeremy Corbyn, it's time to leave the party. Well, this is... Uh... Uh, th this, this, these are remarks um, uh, attributed to Paul Kenny, Sir Paul Kenny, um, the head of the GMB union, which was one of the unions, I think, that backed, the many unions that backed uh, Jeremy Corbyn. And I think one of the biggest problems that Jeremy Corbyn is going to have is to manage the chorus of voices around him because I think the risk is that unless he has specifically authorised a lot of what is being said in his name, mm -hmm. uh, the, if you like, the, uh, the character of his shadow administration is going to be shaped for him and he will lose control of it. And I think we can already see today in the headlines that um, the media will write about him whatever they want to write. Uh, he has to make relationships with uh, newspapers, broadcasters, and he has to uh, engage with them in order to tell them what he actually thinks rather than what is being attributed to him. So I think that um, today, on the second day, uh, as, as party leader is the greatest risk that faces him. And it links also to um, all the, the stories about hard left entryists trying to get back into the Labour Party, mm -hmm. the intimidation. I wasn't at the conference yesterday, but the apparent intimidation by some activists of people who they knew, members of Parliament who they knew had not backed Jeremy but, Corbyn but didn't the, is didn't, very ugly. But didn't the numbers, when we, when we got the spreadsheet of who had voted for Jeremy Corbyn, and let's not forget, 60% in the first round, mm. that's pretty decent. Doesn't that lend some weight to Paul Kenny's words here. Now, actually, he does have a mandate from the party, a bigger mandate than David Cameron had when he became a leader of the he Conservatives. He does indeed, Neil, but what I don't think he has is a mandate from the Parliamentary Party. And it's saying here, back Corbyn or quit Labour. Now, I, I would guess, I haven't seen the precise figures... It's one member, one vote these days. Yeah, yeah no, 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 but, but within the Parliamentary Party, I would say about 20 MPs broadly agree with Just to interrupt, we're just hearing, we were discussing this in the break, John McDonnell uh, to be Shadow Chancellor. Ah. Your reaction, well, first of all? Sir. Well, my reaction to that was that he had more or less promised John McDonnell, his campaign manager, another man from the hard left, to be his shadow chancellor. And I think Angela Eagle was after it as well, and there were some suggestions that, that others may have wanted it. So I think that the fact that he hasn't named him first shows there's been quite a bit of arguing going on already behind the scenes. But back to what I was saying about... Mm, sorry. Um, so, yes, sure. Back to, I think there's about one in ten MPs, at best, agree broadly with the sort of... Pu uh, um, fringe of the party which Jeremy Corbyn was in. So if they're going to back him, they'll find it impossible to back him So they, completely. So they'd all have to leave the Labour Party. Well, the, the, so the, it's, the it's front page ridiculous. of The Guardian, uh, one of those who certainly were, were assumed wouldn't have been going to the front bench anyway, uh, Chukulamuna, has, has decided to step back because of, precisely because of, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's stance, well, or rather opaque on, stance uh, opaque on... Opaque stance on Europe. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, there are two issues which are now beginning to emerge. First of all, uh, the, as you say, the opacity of his stance on Europe and also on NATO. I think this is where Tom Watson, as the new deputy leader, mm. is going to have a very important role in a clarifying major policy. You know, Her Majesty's official opposition has got to have a clear policy on Britain's membership of the European Union and has got to have a clear policy on Britain's membership of NATO. And I think that Tom Watson, who is a sophisticated politician um, of the real world, will be one of the voices that will be insisting on clarity in relation to that. But I just wanted to, um, um, to follow up the point uh, which, which I think Dave made about the, uh, <coughs> the, the nature of Jeremy Corbyn's victory. I mean, he was overwhelmingly elected by the new registered supporters, the people who've paid three pounds to play a part in this leadership contest. The big question is what continuing 
part they play. Do they join the Labour Party? Mm -hmm. uh, do they continue to provide activist uh, support? Or uh, in, in, is his mandate under, undermined by their disappearance from a relationship with the Labour Party. I mean, of course, all of this was because of the, the, the chap who went before Jeremy mm. Corbyn, Ed Miliband's changes to the, to, to, the, uh, to the rules around the election. I mean, has Ed Miliband lost the Labour Party two, not one, general mm. elections? Yeah, and I also think, in fairness, that the, among the, 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 the full members of the Labour Party, I think he polled close to 50 percent, so uh, he probably... He did. Yeah, I mean, so he, he, he probably would have... He, 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 no, that's, he that's, that's, a, that's an important point. But it, he was overwhelmingly the choice of registered supporters. I think he got something like 85 yeah. percent of registered supporters. But yes, no, it's important not to misrepresent the strength of the support that he has among uh, regular Grassroots, uh, grassroots members. Let's, let's bring it back to the to the front page of the the Telegraph here, and the the, the unions are, are threatening to agitate. Um, what do we make of this? I mean, obviously, a degree of his power base does come from it. Well, let's not uh, forget the, the first thing that uh, Jeremy did after winning the leadership uh, on Saturday was to sneak out the back door of the conference centre and go down to the Sanctuary House pub in Westminster and have a lime juice and soda with his big mate, Red Len McCluskey, leader of Unite and one of Ed Miliband's biggest, or Ed Miliband's biggest uh, um, financial backer. I think um, he's quite uh, assured that he'll get continued backing from that union. Um, the question is, and which will worry some people, is will the unions feel that they've got carte blanche to really step up the, the sort of demos action and um, protests that, that, that Jeremy Corbyn seems to like so much. But I think the question there is, you know, J Jeremy Corbyn, un, you know, has an overwhelming mandate within the Labour Party. It's three new sections, members, trade union members, yeah. the affiliates and uh, registered supporters. But he now has to build a mandate in the country more broadly beyond the Labour Party and this is very unlikely to uh, build that support and confidence. Should, should we be reading much into the fact that you know we're coming to close of play on Sunday evening day after the, uh, the leadership the, the new leader was announced and we're still pretty much in the dark as to the to the formation of his cabinet uh, as to who will be in his shadow cabinet? No, I think I think you've had the significant uh, the, 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 the major posts mm -hmm. um, announced uh, you, you said, just said John McDonnell has been appointed as the shadow chancellor. So you've got the shadow chancellor, shadow foreign secretary, shadow uh, home secretary. You've got the major positions mm -hmm. in post. The question is what happens when the rest of the front bench, how, how easy that's going to be, how many MPs are prepared to take those positions. I'm not so sure he was that organised. Uh, I think a lot of this has all been done on the hoof. I don't know. But, uh, for instance, when David Cameron was going into election, we read in the recent biography that uh, he'd planned a speech for if he'd lost. So he'd, he'd prepared for that. We listened to Jeremy's speech yesterday, 22 minutes. It sounded like somebody standing in the pub telling you what you think about how the world should be. And it was... You know, it's probably a speech he'd made many times before, but it was, you know, it was not a prepared speech and it didn't tell us anything new. And I was getting calls on Friday night, late on Friday night, from people who were being approached at that stage about jobs and asking what I thought, sounding me out, really, as a sounding board. So I'm not sure he'd done any mm. of this too mm. far in advance. And uh, perhaps that's just a measure of... Of, of what a big job he's taken on from coming from virtually nowhere. And undoubtedly a very busy week ahead with the trade union bill and then Prime Minister's questions at which we assume he'll be taking the dispatch box. We don't know it for certain. Guys, we'll be back uh, with you in just a few minutes' time. We'll take a break, but immediately after it, we will be talking about whether or not we will be about to have the coldest winter in 50 years. See you in a sec. Well, as you can see, I'm joined by Dame Tessa Jowell and David Wooding. Lovely to see you both. Uh, and you. as we were mentioning, there is a big story in town, the Labour leadership. But of course, there was another election within Labour ranks this week, uh, one in which you were narrowly pipped to the post. I was. And maybe uh, some would say not so narrowly. Um, I did very well among Labour Party members, but uh, what really... Uh, I mean, I could never have won 
with the sort of tidal wave of uh, registered supporters and trade union affiliates. But I'm very glad I tried. I'm very proud of my campaign. And now I wish Sadiq Khan well. And I can't see your, your mobile phone just waiting for that from that call from Jeremy, presumably for a... Uh, no, no, he might uh, probably uh, anticipate that it wouldn't get it wouldn't get a yes for an answer from well, me well as you were suggesting that i mean th there has been you know quite a swell of support for for, for this man here he is a, a, a greater mandate than david cameron had when he took over uh, the conservative party i mean the title there what's left well there, there there might not be many people within the parliamentary party uh, supporting him david but there are plenty of people it would appear within the wider labor ranks yes i mean he he won the vote with the not only the supporters, these three pounders as we call them, um, who paid to just get that vote, but they, I think he got nearly 50% of the proper uh, grassroots uh, Labour members. So the full members support him overwhelmingly as well. Um, but there is a cream, a, a, a cream of the crop. Well, some might suggest that have made themselves absolutely 100% unavailable uh, to Jeremy Corbyn for selection in the shadow We've cabinet. I mean, are there any names there that we're surprised by? Well, I think the, uh, the I mean, I think the problem that uh, Jeremy Corbyn is now going to face is that his politics are being written for him, and uh, he's going to have to move very fast to define, to tackle some of the myths, you know, the... Uh, you're you're well, talking about, for example, the front page of The Sun. front page of The Sun that um, he plans to abolish the army. This isn't a plan currently. This is something no, he said three years ago. Three, yes, and I don't think he actually uh, said that. He was talking about um, peace-loving countries like Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it was a casual remark, but, of course, now he's leader of the opposition. It takes enormous significance but there are other very important points of difference that are beginning to emerge one of them a fault line which meant that Chukaramuna uh, at the time says he was sacked uh, he makes it clear that they left by mutual agreement uh, and that's the our continued membership of the European Union um, a second is our continued membership of NATO and what's interesting now is that Tom Watson the new deputy leader I think will be a very important broker of the definitive interpretation on policy in relation to these major issues and it's going to be badly needed because you can't be the leader of the Labour Party and uncertain about whether you want Britain to leave the EU at I mean, a time when we're close to a referendum on that. David, wouldn't it have served the party's broader interests if a few of these big names had, had hung around and, and just waited to see if there might just be a position in the shadow cabinet? I mean, in a kind of a clear short sense, you know, you know exercising some influence on uh, Jeremy Corbyn's kind of uh, political instincts from within the cabinet itself rather than the back well, benches. It's one of these things, it's integrity on the one hand or, or unity on the other and one of the reasons people like Jeremy Corbyn is that he says what he thinks and he stood mm. by it. He hasn't changed a, a view on a single no. thing for 30, 40 years I don't think and, and so it must be very difficult if, and he is from the fringes of the Labour Party, he is from the, an extreme fringe, he's rebelled 500 times against the Labour Party. He's defied the whip that many times. So mainstream Labour MPs quite understandably feel, well, I, I don't agree with a lot of what this man stands for, so I can't serve in his cabinet. I think Dave, I think Dave is absolutely right. And there's an issue of plausibility. You can't, you know, if you are a member of the shadow cabinet, you accept collective responsibility. And a number of the people who have not, who have declined to be members of his shadow cabinet couldn't do that. You have to kind of keep it plausible. Mm. And, you, and, and ultimately, you have to be true to yourself, otherwise you're never going to be convincing to a wider audience. Uh, the eye carries on its front page a few of the names that we, we see kind of, uh, have already been announced. There's a couple of interesting ones there. Andy Burnham, of course, always left, kept his options open. Hilary Benn, of course, Senator Tony getting, getting foreign affairs. It's the Charlie Faulkner appointment, um, which, which some might find interesting, particularly given the, the legal advice that he was providing and the legal advice that perhaps changed slightly as regards the Iraq war. Yes, which is a big... A uh, big issue for Jeremy Corbyn. And back to Andy Burnham as well. Andy Burnham was saying during the campaign um, on, a, on a video that we published in The Sun online, 
uh, that uh, if Jeremy Corbyn became the leader, it would be a disaster. And mm -hmm. now he is going to be one of his key. I actually think, you know, given, if having Charlie Faulkner in his shadow cabinet is very good news. It's very good news because he will give Jeremy Corbyn very good clear and unambiguous advice mm, that's true. and he will also be one of the people in the shadow cabinet that will be prepared to take the argument on and I think that will fortify some of the other people um, who may be less willing to uh, confront uh, the new leader. But as you were pointing out, the, the un Neil, the unusual thing about this is Lord Fontenot was an arch Blairite mm. and uh, of course it's, it is a bit chalk and cheese politically. I mean, are we expecting to see those, those fault lines between kind of uh, new old Labour and old new Labour, if you see <laughs> what I mean? Are we, are we expecting those to be plastered over for the time being, to just for everyone to wait and see exactly how Jeremy Corbyn's going to move forward? I don't... Th I think that the differences are so profound that that will actually be very difficult. Mm. And again, it comes back to the issue of, um, of plausibility. I think the first and most urgent thing is um, to be rather better at managing um, or engaging with the media because as Dave says you know it's it's Jeremy Corbyn's authenticity that has won so much support among activists but you've got the media um, scouring around for things that he said up to 20 years ago some of which you know are you know quite savory when they appear on the front page of a, a newspaper but he's gonna have to deal with that you know yeah. you can't be uh, you can't be a convincing leader of the opposition and have to deal with these kind and, of headlines and the other every thing, day the test is absolutely right here the other thing is when he was Jeremy Corbyn backbench MP nobody gave two hoots about no, it. We'd exactly sit, we would sit in the in the press gallery reporting a debate in Parliament and he'd stand up and say something which was so off the wall we would ignore it, it wouldn't be published mm. in the paper and he's such a minor figure. Now when he says anything we'll be hanging Front on it, every word yeah. and everything and he this, says will be scrutinised. And this is stuff that he has debate. said during his political career I and mean, if we take David Cameron as a parallel example mm. we go all the way back to his undergraduate days sometimes yeah. to investigate what made the man mm. but at the same time you know, we, he clearly always had political ambitions, so has perhaps limited himself. I mean, is there not a role for someone like Jeremy Corbyn in politics who hasn't been quite so circumspect all the way through his adult life? But, uh, exactly. And um, will he change? Will he have to check? Will he have to smarten himself up? Will he, in fact, suddenly start using more measured language because he knows that every word he says will be scrutinised. Well, I doubt, you know, I don't think he will because I think that he reckons that that is his winning ticket. And, you know, that's why these, you know, was it 85% of the registered supporters, the people who had joined the Labour Party, um, the people who joined the Labour Party only to be able to vote in this election. Why? And they come from other parties, they supported other parties, no party at all, you know, a kind of coalition of protest organisations and people who genuinely want a different kind of politics. But, you know, he now has a constituency and it's a constituency that's delivered him as leader of the Labour Party. But the Labour Party has to persuade the rest of the country that it's fit to govern locally and nationally. Well, there was, there was an interesting comment, wasn't there, just ahead of Jeremy Corbyn being announced as leader from the party's general secretary, suggesting that those who had paid their £3 to join the party might wish to convert that, as many of them had done, to becoming full members and get out on the doorstep and actually do some campaigning. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a fair invitation. And, to give um, the members of the Green I, Party. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, d I doubt if many of them will, quite honestly. Are we in any way surprised that there hasn't been a kind of a post-election bounce as yet, a perceptible one for Jeremy Corbyn? I mean, you don't have to, you know, you ha I can't see any kind of you know, surge in kind of popularity just yet. Certainly the papers, I mean, the Daily Mail here is going down the, the, the rabid trade union line, which, is, which has been used against the left in the past. I mean, how long can the press be so resolutely negative before either the press or Jeremy Corbyn end well, up looking... Well, first of all, there haven't been any polls yet. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see when uh, the first polls are published, which I should think will be round about the time or just after um, the, the Labour Party conference. I think the judgment, though, by sort of camp 
Corbyn will be, can they reach beyond the newspaper headlines using social media and uh, digital media to communicate with those registered supporters and activists beyond and create a sense of immunity um, to the reliance that leaders have traditionally had on the mainstream media. Tessa David, we'll leave it there for just a moment and to take a quick break, but coming up immediately afterwards, a rail strike a day keeps inferior journeys at bay. You and I will find out what that means after the break. Countries. Let's move on to the story we were uh, talking about just before the break. At the top there, um, that rail strikes are, are good for commuters and country. Please explain this one to me. This is great news for Jeremy Corbyn um, and his friends. Um, Rail strikes are good for you. They may be a source of endless frustration to us all, but in fact, they, they, they raise our spirits. Um, according to this study from the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, um, it may even save us £100 a year for some travellers, because obviously we don't well, pay yeah, for obviously, rail you're, not pay, you're not paying but, for your ticket. But one in 20 people find uh, superior journeys that are quicker and cheaper. They find other ways of getting around. It gives you community spirit, and it's snapping you away from the rush hour. I don't believe this. Yeah, I'm, 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 wonder, I'm wondering if this, this was a survey carried out, I don't know, carried out by the RMT. King's Cross, or <laughs> outside Clapham Junction in South West Well, well, well they analysed 20 days uh, data from commuters' Oyster cards and uh, speaking to various people, and they found um, that, mo you know, most of them... A lot of people have stayed at home. I, I can't believe it, but it doesn't make sense to me because no, I, one I of the reasons um, that they give is that it, 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 it gives you some kind of extra pep in your in your step because you've got the to find things. The findings are in a working paper from the University of Oxford. Oh, well, I do, do recall. Perhaps it's do, still work in progress. <laughs> I, I do recall <laughs> these stories about, uh, particularly in London, where people. Diff different novel ways people are getting mm. to work. Some of them are coming down on skateboards or, or jumping, a, hiring a boat or something. Adults on scooters. It's something yes. that should never, ever be allowed.